speaker, Anthony Belov, holds a bachelor in architecture from Pratt Institute and a graduate degree in museum leadership from the Bank Street College of Education. He is a longtime volunteer and board member of the Merchant's House Museum and is an aficionado in 19th century American decorative arts and architecture. Anthony has also asked me, in lieu of whatever paltry introduction I might be able to give to the incredible Merchant's House Museum, um, Anthony has asked me to kick off the evening with this short-ish film, which hopefully you will all be able to see and hear. Um, once that's done, Anthony will hop in and he will take us into the merchant's house as no one else could and as no one else has yet. <laughs> so here we go. New Yorkers always seem to be in a hurry. So you might have walked along East 4th Street here in Manhattan and never noticed the stately home sitting quietly at number 29. Or maybe you did and wondered what it looked like inside. The Treadwell family lived here for almost 100 years, and what they left behind is quite extraordinary. It's now the Merchant's House Museum, but the story begins in 1835 when a wealthy importer named Seabury Treadwell bought it for $18,000. It was a hefty sum back then, equivalent now to about a half million dollars, which might get you a studio apartment here in Manhattan today. It's important to understand that land was always expensive on the island of Manhattan. And as such, houses in New York City were not often as large as the ones you see in some other cities in the United States and other affluent cities in England. The standard New York City lot is 25 feet wide, and you can just get so much house into a 25 foot wide lot. New York was booming, and merchants like Treadwell were reaping the benefits. Well, they were the biggest players in town. This was a, a city that was based on maritime commerce. Virtually everyone was engaged in some form, the shipbuilders, even the lawyers. It was a city of merchants and mariners. It is hard to imagine this harbor as the bustling port it once was. Thousands upon thousands of tons of goods were being shipped here from Europe and Asia on sailing ships. Treadwell specialty was hardware. He was a hardware merchant, meaning that he imported anything and everything made of metal, like nails and screws and latches and doorknobs, cast iron skillets or surveyor's chains, farm implements. That's what hardware meant. When the Erie Canal opened in 1825, creating a navigable route from New York City and the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, commerce exploded. Once the Erie Canal opened in 1825, money was pouring into Manhattan because now the wealthy merchants could ship their, their goods to the West. And with all this money coming in, it was the golden age of trade. And so, of course, their lifestyle reflected money that they were earning. As the merchants grew more prosperous, they wanted to live in the Bond Street area, which was the city's most exclusive neighborhood then. It was located in what is today's NoHo East Village area. It was a very small area. It was just east of Washington Square, which was also a very fashionable area for the wealthy merchants. It was a cultural center. There was an opera house in this neighborhood that was built in the early 1830s. There was also a leisure garden called the Vauxhall Gardens where people could stroll and take their horses. There was a trotting track. If you were anybody, aspiring to a certain social level, a certain respectability, and wanted to advertise who you were, you moved to the Bond Street area. Considered the first suburb for the wealthy merchants who all had their homes and their businesses down by the South Street Seaport. When Treadwell worked and lived there, the South Street Seaport area was dirty, noisy, and crowded. As commerce increased down there during the 20s, 30s, it became unpleasant to live downtown with all the boxes on the street and the carts rattling and so on. And so they all moved the only place they could move on this island, and that was north. Looking at Manhattan today, it's hard to imagine that moving north for the Treadwells meant heading to East 4th Street. 
But in 1835, that was about as far north as you could go before you hit farmland and cow pastures. This house was built in 1832 by a man named Joseph Brewster. Joseph Brewster was a hatter. He sold hats. But as was the case so often in those days, people speculated as carpenter builders, or they may have been in another business and just bought a few lots and hired just somebody to build the house. The style of this house is completely common for both the neighborhood and for the area. In the period, the row houses were built largely from pattern books that were designed by builders. Without an architect involved, pattern books served as indispensable how-to manuals, and it seemed everyone wanted the same style. This style of row house, late federal Greek revival, became popular in the late 1820s. I think one of the things that the house says, particularly to current New Yorkers, is that New Yorkers really cared about their real estate. They wanted a house that worked for them and for a large and growing family. They wanted to be on the right street in the right neighborhood. They wanted to be near good schools. All of these things were as true in the 19th century as they are today. There were hundreds of these buildings occupied by thousands of people of the highest social status in New York at the time. And what's unique about the merchant's house is it's the only one that's left. I can't tell you how many people have said to me after visiting the house that when they walk into the house, they can feel the 19th century. They can experience. It's as if the Treadwells have just gone out, perhaps shopping on Broadway, and they'll be right back. It's not a recreation. It's not even really a restoration. It's just a maintenance, a maintaining of a home the way a family wanted it to be. The miracle is that it remains intact. This is because Treadwell's youngest daughter never married, never moved out, and never changed anything. Gertrude Treadwell was the eighth child of Eliza and Seabury. They moved into the house in 1835 with seven children. And in 1840, their last child, Gertrude, was born. And she ended up living here her entire life. She died here in 1933 at the age of 93. After her death, a relative realized the value of this unique house, and it was preserved. The layout of the Merchant's House Museum is completely typical for a house of the neighborhood and of the period. On the ground floor, there is the family room, two service rooms, and the kitchen. The main floor, the main entrance hall, the vestibule, two parlors. Second floor, the master bedrooms of Mr. and Mrs. Treadwell. Third floor, the children's rooms. And on the fourth floor, the four servants' rooms. You're climbing up to a very different world, the world of the servants, the world of the people who were meant to be unseen, unheard, but without whom the family could not have functioned in the space. Visiting the various rooms tells us not only what the Treadwells had, but how they and their servants lived. This room is called the family room, and it is called so because this is really where the family spent most of their time. It was the nucleus of the house, and members of the merchant class used it for many different purposes. Children probably did their homework in that room. People read the newspaper in that room. Intimate friends who came calling may have gone down to that room instead of to the grander rooms on the parlor floor. During the day, Mrs. Treadwell would have been here. She would have received uh, tradesmen and businessmen who were coming with deliveries and bills. The family room is where families gathered for meals. The table behind me with its two drop leaves extends to seat a larger number of people than it is right now, all folded up. Remember, there was no central heating back in the mid-1800s. For the Treadwells, fireplaces and coal-burning stoves were the only source of heat. And it was hard to keep the room and food hot. A plate warmer came in very handy. You can see right here, right up against the heat of the fire, is this wonderful tôle peinte, or painted tin plate warmer. Inside, plates would have been kept so that they could remain warm while the family was sitting at the table. It's hard to imagine kicking back in this room and putting your feet up on this glorious red sofa that was of the Greek Revival style. But in fact, the family considered it out of date and had it moved down here from the formal parlor. 
this is just the way life was in those days. And again, it's not that different. We tend to put our best furniture in the living room. I know when I was growing up, there was plastic slip covers on everything. And don't sit in there, that's for company. And that's sort of the same, I think that's a, a, a throwback to earlier times. The interior of the Treadwell home is Greek Revival, which was the latest style when this house was built in the 1830s. Keeping things up to date, especially in the formal parlors, was serious business back then. You have these wonderful twin parlors filled with Greek Revival architecture. They're spacious, they're light and airy, and you can really have a great cotillion in this space. The front parlor is the showpiece of the house. That is really where the Treadwells went all out to impress their friends. The curtains, the matching pair of gas chandeliers, the argon lamps over the Italian marble mantel, the furniture that is high style Rococo revival in the 1850s. Everything represented wealth and status. You didn't go off on a limb. You didn't do wacky things. You didn't make a statement with your furniture other than to say, I am part of the pack, I fit in, I am one of the highbrows that can afford this stuff. There was no sense among the elite people of trying to outdo one another. In fact, they copied one another. They were not the least embarrassed about that. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. And in most homes of the merchant class, you would find a piano. Back in that day, there was no television, there were no movies, there was nothing to do in the evening except gatherings, musical entertainments, and that sort of thing. This is a Nuns and Fishers piano, which was made in New York sometime between the late 1830s and the 1840s, bought for the family, bought for the girls, and this was sort of the trust fund or expensive car in the driveway of its day. And if you could play the piano well, if you could sing, if you could produce music, you were considered a good catch and marriageable material. Along with the music entertainment at sociables, as they were called, there was polite talk and refreshments. When the Treadwell's guests were in the rear parlor, they sat on these very chairs. Of all the many treasures in the Merchant's House Museum, perhaps everyone's favorite is this set of chairs which were probably bought for the house in 1835 when the family moved in. And this represents the work of the finest cabinet maker or furniture maker in New York at the time, the famous Duncan Fife. They were the best of the period, and it's very rare to find a complete set of these chairs, almost impossible to find them still in the house for which they were purchased. One of the things that we know about the merchants class in the early 19th century in New York is they bought wisely and they bought well. They went to the very best purveyors of the latest styles and they invested their money in quality pieces rather than in an enormous quantity of pieces of furniture. Guests could also be wowed by the latest in technology when they visited the Treadwells. The double parlors also boasted these magnificent bronze gasoliers. A gasolier is a chandelier that burns gas. These were installed most likely in 1855 because Con Edison is fond of saying that this house is its oldest residential customer. Originally, the house would have been lit entirely by candlelight and by whale oil. They upgraded to kerosene, they upgraded to argon lamps, they upgraded to the gasoliers, they upgraded to gas lighting in the hallways. They were constantly renewing and changing the form of light that they used in the house. But with the upgrade to gas came complaints that the light was too harsh and too bright. When you lit all six burners of the gasolier, you only got the equivalent of a 60 to 90 watt bulb, which would be considered very dim by modern standards. Gaslight was uh, not necessarily welcomed by everyone. It was considered dangerous. People were afraid of it. An old family legend says that at some point after the Civil War, the gasolier in the rear parlor burst into flames one night, and one of the Treadwell sons was able to put the fire out. The gasolier was pulled down and relegated to the attic, but we do have on top of the sideboard this dent and burn mark in it. So perhaps the story is true. There were two sons and six daughters in the Treadwell family, and they lived here on the third floor in four bedrooms. Now museum offices are installed here, and it's probably a lot quieter than when the children occupied this space. 
How the rooms were distributed, we don't exactly know, but obviously with four rooms and eight children, there was a certain amount of doubling up. The children of the merchant class had their own quarters, but babies and sick children often stayed in their mother's bedroom. Here is Mrs. Treadwell's bedroom. And across the hall was her husband's. It was customary at the time for the father and the mother of the family to have separate bedrooms. And I think to understand why that is the case, you need to know how the women used their bedrooms. It wasn't just a place for sleeping. Her bedroom was a delivery room for all her children. She also died there. It was a room where she entertained her friends. Mrs. Treadwell's close, intimate friends would come upstairs, they'd have tea, they'd chat, gossip perhaps, read out loud, entertain themselves in the privacy of her bedroom. And the room has a great number of bureaus in it. This reminds us that her female guests would come up here and get changed from their street clothes into their party attire before going downstairs for a ball or a party. And sometimes her guests had to spend the night. A lot of people slept in Mrs. Treadwell's room. The Treadwells had a lot of relatives in Long Island, and frequently they would visit, and of course they'd stay all night because the journey was certainly not something you would want to do in a day, in a carriage, and so it was necessary to find places for everybody to sleep. The people those days did not require as much personal space as we do. So adult women, sisters, thought nothing of sharing a bed, and even grown men would share a bed. It was just not an uncommon thing. If you're wondering where the bathroom is, there was none, even for the wealthy Treadwells. Remember, there was no indoor plumbing then. Chamber pots were used to avoid a trip to the outhouse, or the privy, as they would have called it. You'll see also a little bathtub up there. People ask me, how in the world did they manage that? It was one thing to bathe a child in a tub this size, but an adult was another story. It certainly wasn't a bath the way we think of a bath, but um, that was the best you could do when you didn't have running water. And water is very heavy. You think of all the servants carrying all that water upstairs. It's a safe bet that the Treadwell servants were constantly going up and down these very steep stairs, carrying water, food, laundry, buckets of coal, chamber pots, whatever the 10 Treadwells requested. The servant call bells that you see in the kitchen were modern technology in the 1830s. And in fact, there was an advertisement that we found in the commercial advertiser in 1835 that said that the house came with all the modern convenience. And among them would have been a servant, a call bell system. Each uh, bell had a different tone, so the servant would know which room was calling. The only reason the Treadwells could enjoy their comfortable lifestyle in their large home with their large family was because they had servants who did all the work. Many families employed numerous servants. The Treadwells had four. And we at the museum have tried to remind our visitors that they are just as much a part of the story of this museum as the Treadwells and the Treadwells' neighbors living their very comfortable, exalted lifestyle. Imagine a house like this from the servant's perspective, with no electricity, no running water, no modern conveniences or appliances. It was backbreaking work. The kitchen was the heart of the house but the Treadwells seldom entered it. This is where the servants worked. Mrs. Treadwell probably visited from time to time to give orders. The kitchen was always located as far as possible from the rest of the house, because in those days, nobody wanted to smell what was coming from the kitchen. We kind of think that's nice, you know? But not then, they didn't want any hint of what was going on in the kitchen to invade the rest of the house. When the house was built in 1832, there was no stove. Cooking took place over open flames and coals. 
It was certainly a noisy place, a hot place, a messy place, and you didn't come down here in your fine clothing. Definitely not. During this era, most servants were up at dawn and sometimes worked well into the evening. They had one afternoon off a week, and in the mid-19th century, the average pay was one to two dollars a week. The houses they worked in may have been grand, but the rooms where they slept were not. The contents of the servant's room include rosaries hanging from the bedpost, for these girls were all Catholic. You'll see a wash basin and a pitcher. There was also a heating stove, but that was about it. Most domestic servants in New York were young, uneducated Irish Catholic girls who had left their own country during the potato famine to find a better life in America. What they encountered here were hardships they could not have imagined. While we don't know what went on at the Treadwells, in many homes the Protestant employers treated their Catholic servants with contempt. This was an era where there was such prejudice that there was violence against people simply because they were Catholics. We don't understand this today, but it's the, um, the equivalent of some other ethnic groups that are uh, attacked simply for how they look or what faith they might have. The Treadwell family lived in this house for almost 100 years. There are those who believe that some of them may still be here. Why would they leave? The house is so beautiful and rents are so hot that it just makes sense for them to stay. We on the museum staff will never come right out and say the merchant's house is haunted because we don't know that for a fact. We're trained museum professionals. So if we say the museum is haunted, we have to have proof. But what we do have is a lot of evidence that just is simply unexplainable. Over the years, I've been um, told by many people of the various experiences they've had. One stands out of a school group that was going through the house. And a little boy, 10 years old, he got away from the group and went into Seabury Treadwell's room. And when the tour group came in, he looked at the guide and he said, where's that man? And of course, there was no man there. It was just the school group. And they went downstairs. And as soon as the little boy got to the front parlor and saw the portrait of Seabury Treadwell, he pointed at it and he said, that's him. That's the man I saw. Why would a kid lie? Along with the ghosts, the merchant house has had its rescuers past and present. There have been many times that this house has come close to being destroyed. When Gertrude died in 1933, she died impoverished, and all of her possessions in the house were in foreclosure and everything was gonna be sold off. A great nephew of hers, a man named George Chapman, got wind of what was happening. He came down to the house and he realized what a treasure it was. He decided with the help of some friends to take care of the house, to turn it into a museum to illustrate what life was like in the early 19th century for other New Yorkers. The house opened to the public in 1936, and since then it has struggled to survive as the neighborhood around it has changed. Before the Landmarks Law in 1965, um, the house was threatened with demolition many times. The Merchant's House Museum is landmarked both outside and inside, but that cannot protect it from the planned construction next door. The lot right next door to this building on the west of it has recently been purchased and plans have been filed and approved for the construction of a hotel building on that site. The building next door has been sold and it's going to be demolished and something else is going to be built there. There is a lot of concerns, not just on my behalf and not just the people who work here in the museum, but from neighbors who recognize this building for the treasure that it is. Now, the Merchant's House is not by any means opposed to development. That's not it. What we're concerned about is what the jackhammering and the backhoeing and the bulldozers and the undermining and the digging of our foundations is going to do to this building. The museum staff is working with consulting engineers to develop a series of protection plans. 
Keeping this fragile building intact has been an ongoing battle. Discussing the protection plans. But none of it seems to get in the way of what goes on within these old walls. First and foremost, of course, is the tour of the house, because that's when where visitors can experience the 19th century almost hands-on. There also are lectures, special events, and of course, people come to meet the ghosts. The past does come alive here. What do visitors like most about the museum? Interestingly enough, it's not anything specific. I'd say the vast number of people just respond to the, just the aura, the essence of this museum. They walk in the front door and pow. And I'm not talking about a V8. They just get it, and they get it in a way that they take with them when they leave, and they never forget. Our history defines us, and um, when I, I think it's important for people to see how individuals lived here in New York City and what life was like back then. And this house does that. It puts you in that place, in that time. You can see the struggles, you can see uh, the luxuries, and it can teach children uh, things that they read in books and really actually see it and experience it. It's safe to say that Seabury Treadwell never thought that people in the 21st century would be walking around his house. But if that 10-year-old schoolboy is correct, and Mr. Treadwell is still in residence, chances are he's enjoying all the attention. was wonderful. Anthony, you're here. here Take I it am. away. Great. Okay, how's that? Is it working? Looks great. Terrific. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we wanted to show this wonderful video that the City of New York produced because it gives as good a virtual tour as anyone could ever provide of the house. But, um, and so I wanted to go in a different direction with my tour and talk about very specific points, very fine points of the architecture and what the architecture tells us. These, these fine points are clues. Their cues, their signals for how we're supposed to perceive the house and the residents of the house and how we're expected to behave within the house. Uh, every house has these, every building has these, but how often do we think about them? So uh, as uh, Ms. Bandero said, God is in the details. And so we're gonna take a look at the details of the Merchant's House Museum. Now, let me just ask, did you see the slide change? Yes. Great, okay, we're in business, excellent. So here's the facade of the Merchant's House and those of you who walk down East 4th Street have seen this house, uh, has seen this facade if you've not been inside yet. We're going to talk about some of the clues that this house divulges about what it symbolizes, what it meant to the people who built it, the people who lived in it, and how we should be reacting to what we're seeing. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the house. This is a photo taken sometime between 1869 and 1882. It's a miracle that this photo exists. When Brewster built the Merchant's House, he built twins. He built a house right next door to it. And some intrepid photographer one day uh, in that time frame, with all of the houses that were all over New York City at the time, decided to snap this photo. And it proves that the house, which no longer stands, to the right, uh, here it's parged, it has a stucco covering on it, and the parlor windows have been extended down to the floor level. It proves that the two houses were identical, at least on the outside. What happened to the house next door? Well, in 1869, 
Liederkranz Society, which still exists, it's a German music society, and they're now based up on East 87th Street, combined three houses on East 4th Street into a clubhouse and concert hall for themselves. And if you can see my cursor, the house that I'm highlighting right now is the twin of the Merchant's House. The Merchant's House is here, just in the left frame of the photo. When they combined the three houses, they eliminated the peak roof and added a full fourth story. You'll notice that they chose to match the window framing with an Italian eight house on the other side of the lot. Notice the difference between the door frames, and this is the big clue as to this house being federal and this house being Italian eight. And then they added a pediment here in the middle house to define this as the main entrance. And if you look past this very Victorian pediment, you'll see that this house also had uh, an arch doorway very similar to the merchant's house, although it was not built at the same time. It was built just a little bit later. Bear in mind also that the merchant's house was not built for the Treadwell family who lived here for almost 100 years. house that was already three years old. And one could argue quite convincingly that the merchant's house and houses of its ilk represent the pinnacle of federal architecture in New York. This is really the zenith of the style. And by 1832, when this house was being built, this photo, by the way, dates to about 1940, it was already beginning to wane in popularity. What does federal mean? Most importantly, you see classical detailing on the house. Uh, which is inspired not by Grecian architecture, but by Roman architecture. You have these very, this very ornate cornice, you have a very ornate door frame, you've got ionic columns inset within it, but the building is not Greek inspired. And one of the real telltale signs is this peaked roof. And here's a photo of the house today, uh, I'm missing its twin, unfortunately, but you can see quite clearly that the house has a peaked roof. Now, a Greek Revival house, uh, well, I'm sorry, let's go back a little bit. This is a house on Bond Street, number 23 Bond Street, uh, which was built for the wards in 1828 uh, to 1831, sometime in that time period. And this represents a grand federal mansion of the style just before the merchant's house. And if you compare them, what stands out most is the door frame. And I'm very fond of saying when I give architectural tours of uh, any period architecture, it's the door more than any other single feature which defines the, uh, defines the style of the house. So I, I think you can see just by comparing these two photos, the similarities and the differences between the two houses, uh, by the way, 23 Bond Street no longer stands. Here is 6 Washington Square North in its heyday. And here you can see very clearly the differences between a late federal house and a Greek revival house. Interestingly enough, 6 Washington Square was built the year before the Merchant's House was constructed. So it was completed in 1831. And this was a very new style at the time. You can see certainly the difference in the door and framing. And look at the cornices as well. And also notice no dormer windows. By the early 1830s, roofing technology had advanced to the point where you could use a relatively flat roof. And so it was not necessary to have a peaked roof just to make sure that rain didn't enter the building. Another big difference between these two houses houses, I would venture to say, is that the merchant's house, although built a year later, is largely handmade. Whereas in Grecian architecture, you can see machinery to produce linear architecture of a plainer sort, of a Grecian style, not as elaborate, not as ornate as a Roman style would entail. And here are the big differences between federal house on the left and a Greek revival house on the right even though they're contemporaries. Now I said the, the door is a big clue to what the style of a house is. And here is the quintessential late federal door frame. Uh, this is the merchant's house. The door is 
surrounded by Sing Sing marble. This is a white marble that was quarried uh, just up the river along with the stoop. And when it was first uh, built, all the marble details, you can see some of the window trim and also the basement detailing here in the lower left hand corner, was all highly polished. So it looked more like a fireplace than it uh, does today being all pitted with age and acid rain, et cetera, which makes it look more like limestone today. But you have to imagine this being very shiny marble. The arch doorway is very federal. The Gibbs surround, which is a molding broken by these blocks, is very typical of late federal architecture. Notice the carved wood fan light set within the archway. This is wood. The freestanding ionic columns on each side of the front door, which is your first clue that maybe what you see inside is not going to be federal, but it's going to be something else instead. Each one of these details cost money. You have to pay extra for the marble surround. You have to pay extra for the blocks that makes it a Gibbs doorway. You have to pay extra for the columns, for the carved archway, for the detail in the entablature running across the columns. Each one of these things costs extra money. So you walk by on the street, you look at this house, and you know the people in it are extremely affluent. It says there is money in this house. The cornice, likewise. I made a point of, of highlighting the cornice in the Greek Revival House in Washington Square North. It was very linear, very plain, very simple, very Grecian. This cornice is anything but Grecian. And bear in mind that all this elaborate swagging and fruit carving and the campus leaf and lentils and everything were done by hand. This is all hand carved. And even in 1832, hand carving cost money. The iron railings as well. These very rare surviving, what we call birdcage, uh, or urn newels, urn being the more appropriate uh, uh, nomenclature, but these are very expensive as well. A lot of detailing here, a lot of hand work is a co combination of cast iron and wrought iron on these urns. And once houses all over the city had these urn newel posts in front of their doorways. Now there's probably fewer than a half a dozen survive. And the cast iron too is very interesting because this represents some of the earliest cast iron used in architecture in the city. You don't see it much before about 1830, 1831. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a combination of machine made, very early machine made elements, at least in the outside of the house and the handwork. But enough about the outside, let's go inside. Here are the floor plans of the Merchant's House, which were drawn by the Historic American Building Survey in the late 1930s. These are available online. You can download these and study them for yourselves. But I want to highlight right now the parlor floor. And the reason being, apart from the obvious that the parlor is the grandest floor in the house, I want you to note the floor plan. Because, as I mentioned in the video that you just saw, you can just get so much house on a 25-foot wide lot. And so typical of all row houses of this type and straight through the 19th century and into the 20th century, pretty much, is this side hallway with rooms opening off of it. And you'll see this floor plan on pretty much all the floors in the house except for the top floor. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. First clue, once you've been admitted into the house that this is a very grand house, is this vestibule or foyer area between the outer on the left and the inner on the right doorways. This uh, ceiling is actually one of my favorite plaster details in the entire house. I just think it's extremely Jeffersonian and very beautiful. And one of the remarkable survivors in this house, which defines how special it is, why it's special, is that the original uh, faux stone walls survive. This uh, is painted to look like Siena marble. It's not. not. And when the house was rescued in the mid 1930s, these, wall, uh, these walls were stabilized and restored where needed, 
Now, did every house in the Bond Street area have these walls? I don't know the answer to that question. I doubt it. But many of them would have, and this is another statement of the affluence of the residents, because uh, faux painting frequently costs more than the real thing, although probably not in this case. Notice the plainness of the main entrance and the ornateness of the secondary entrance, the doorway which leads into the hallway. You're walking from left to right. You're not expected to turn around and look back. Why would you do that? You probably would only quickly glance up in passing, but it was a golden opportunity to, to, to elaborate on a space. Also notice in the front archway, the way the arch collides with the wall, and I'll show you a clearer image of this. Here's looking back at the front entranceway. And you see the way the arch comes around and crashes into the dividing wall between the foyer in this case and the parlor on just the other side of that wall. Now, years ago, it was customary to say this was an example of naive craftsmen building a house. But that's pretty ridiculous when you think about the quality of the workmanship and the expense that went into this house. What this represents is a very typical, I think, architectural detail that enables the outside of the main entrance to have grand proportions without having to scale the hallway correspondingly and lose space from the parlor. You're gonna live in the parlor after all, not in the hallway. And so the hallway is just as narrow as it can possibly be without losing the side light on the west side of the door and during uh, my volunteer work with GVSHP uh, in various house tours, I made a point of looking at other houses of this style of this era. And sure enough, almost all of them have the same detail in them. So you see the difference between that doorway and here is the inner doorway looking back towards the entrance. Very federal in detailing. There's not a Grecian element in it. Now remember, this is Brewster building a house in 1832, but the Treadwells bought in 1835. Brewster was uh, building this house for, uh, on spec, he ultimately planned to sell this house. And in 1832, the Greek Revival was just coming into style. And he, as an older investor, felt very comfortable with the federal style. And so the builders, who knows if they were even comfortable with Greek Revival or not, the whole ethos, the whole understanding, was still very much of an 18th century perspective. There's a lot of 18th century feel to this house. The federal style, even though it's 19th century, harkens back to the late 18th century and to the sensibilities and to the scale of 18th century architecture. But when you walk into the hallway, the receiving hallway, all that changes. There is Greek revival architecture throughout this floor of the house and at that point it would have been the latest style. So you're walking into a late federal house which has stunning Greek Revival interiors and I would also venture to guess that these interiors were not all that different from other houses built at the same time in this neighborhood. Again the important factor is that this house happens to survive intact where all the others don't. So the first thing confronting you in this uh, hallway is a very ornate mule post, which we'll talk about in a moment. And notice the light. L notice the amount of light that's entering this space. If you're aware of later 19th century brownstones, as we call them, built uptown after the Civil War, you know they're not this wide. You know they're not this light inside. Because of the width of this house, they could bring the staircase all the way to the back wall. And so there's a window illuminating the turn in the staircase, flooding this hallway with light. In the later 19th century, when building lots got narrower, speculators would, let's say, buy five 25 foot wide building lots uptown and cram eight or nine buildings into them. So the houses got correspondingly narrower. You pull the staircase forward so that it's just inside the entranceway. And then that rear parlor could be turned 90 degrees and stretch across the whole back 
of the house and just the front parlor corresponded to this hallway situation. So you had a very narrow front hallway, which really was confined for, for very high holy days in terms of reception. And the back parlor, which retained some semblance to the size of these parlors, was used more frequently and more regularly by the family itself, simply because it was more comfortable. Let's look at that Newell Post. In 1832 already, this Newell Post is a little bit dated. The era of heavily carved um, empire, as we call it, furniture, was coming to an end by the early 1830s. If you're familiar with the Meeks Broadside, which was uh, published in 1831, you know they're already uh, pushing a style of furniture we now call pillar and scroll, or late empire, which is all curved lines and very little, if any, carved detail. This Newell Post is furniture quality. Whoever carved this Newell Post was a master craftsman and was clearly somebody who was accustomed to making furniture in the now fading American Empire style. But I'm sure no one looked at this Newell Post and did anything else but admire it because it is so gorgeous. And again, it's a signal, it's a sign. It tells you what sort of house you've entered and what level in the house you're currently standing in. This is the grandest of the grand. It defines the space, it defines how you act within that space. And here is that space. For those of you who've never been to the Merchant's House Museum, I'm sure you've seen this photograph online. You certainly saw something similar to this in the video. These famous parlors, this stunning Greek revival architecture. We're looking at the front parlor, which is the grandest, most formal room in the house, with our backs to the rear parlor, which in terms of size is equal, equal measurements, but in terms of use, was a step down. Front parlor, ultra formal, back parlor, less formal, used more often. Here's the back parlor. We have, recreate, we have interpreted the house to the era after the gasoliers were installed in 1855, and up to the point in time when Seabury Treadwell passes away in 1865. So we're representing the house in its mid 19th century appearance. Of course, it's all guesswork. We don't know what it looked like then, but we've arranged the rear parlor as a sitting room slash dining room because this is where formal dining would have been enjoyed once uh, technology approached the possibility of serving formal meals at home. Before this time, if you wanted to throw a really grand party, it would be extremely difficult to do it in your home. You more often than not went out to uh, a restaurant that specialized in this sort of thing, such as Delmonico's. Here is that column wall between the parlors with the mahogany doors closed. Again, there's a symbol here, there's a clue here, there's a hint here of how you should be reacting to all this. Not only are these doors of furniture quality once again, but the doors are solid Santo Domingo mahogany. This is the best of the best. These doors cost a fortune. And anybody who was permitted into this level of the house would be aware of the luxuriousness of these doors and everything else they're seeing on this floor. <coughs> the plaster work has been called the best surviving plaster work of this era in the Northeast. And the gentleman, uh, David Flaherty, who restored the plaster work in the 1970s, uh, also worked on many of the important historic buildings in Washington, DC, including the Capitol building and the, uh, the Mint, and said the plaster work in these parlors is the equivalent of anything he's ever worked on anywhere else. Now, luckily, we had the uh, gasolier removed for conservation and were able to photograph the medallion without the gasolier interfering in any way with our sight lines. And for years, I was fond of telling visitors that as far as I know, this medallion and the one in the rear parlor are unique to this house because you notice they've been cut into the floor joists above. There's a recess into which that acanthus scroll work is set. Well, just recently, 
I was lucky enough to get to gain admittance to 26 Bond Street, which on the outside resembles uh, this house in a very ruinous condition. And as you can see, the inside, well, it survives miraculously, but not in great shape. This is the entrance uh, vestibule, the space in the merchant's house where I showed you the Siena, the faux Siena marble. And sure enough, there in the ceiling is a recessed ceiling medallion, very similar to the ones in the merchant's house parlors. Now, you can't tell from this photo, the scale is much smaller because this is just the entrance hallway, but it's a safe bet to say that the same medallion specialist created both both of these medallions. So this proves that other houses, at least some other houses, had these medallions as well. As far as we know, ours are the only ones surviving intact and in a residential space as opposed to a public space. One last quick glance at this marvelous Greek plaster work. I like to say welcome to Athens on the Hudson when we walk into these parlors. I think the clues are all there and very clear for all of you. You know how you're supposed to behave in these parlors. You understand what, that, what you're looking at is very expensive. Signs of, of education, signs of wealth, signs of culture. And ionic columns abound because ionic columns are about as Greek as anything gets. Not only the plaster work tells you some of the, um, the qualities of the house, but even the hardware. This is a photograph of one of the doorknobs on the, um, the dining room door. And when the doors were installed, the hardware was silver plated. This is electroplated silver. Silver was much more expensive in the early 19th century than it became later in the century after some of the big strikes out in the, uh, the Southwest. Uh, and so to have silver, even silver plated doorknobs on your parlor floor was certainly a message that was being sent. And wonderfully enough, there's also an example of early American industry here. America struggled after the revolution to set up industries of their own. England succeeded in quashing almost all efforts at industrialization of America uh, during the colonial period. And one of the first industries to take off in America was the glass industry. You've probably all heard the words sandwich glass. One of the large glass factories in America was located in Sandwich, Massachusetts. And these knobs, which you find on shutters and cabinets throughout the house, are without a doubt early American pressed glass. And in 1832, there would have been a subtle statement here. This hardware, or not hardware since it's not metal, is American. So let's head upstairs. Uh, this wonderful photograph shows you how the staircase doubles back on itself. This was necessary in order to get the staircase away from the front door and to allow for that window, which not only illuminates the staircase itself during the day, but also both of these hallways. When I give my behind the ropes tours, at the museum in the winter months. One of the specialized tours is about lighting. And I know people who take the tour really enjoy being challenged about trying to imagine what it was like to light a house like this. We take lighting so for granted now, but in earlier times before there was electricity and, and, and readily available intense lighting, people came up with all sorts of solutions to try to get light into their houses. You'll see some other examples as we walk through the house as well. Notice the mahogany banister. This uh, not only is for show down on the parlor floor, but continues up to the bedroom floor. And so it is an extravagance, it is expensive, and it also indicates that people other than the family were being admitted up to this level of the house as well. Notice also the Greek Revival door frames here, the entrances to the bedroom. Now, grand as the Newell Post was on the parlor floor, we have an almost as grand Newell Post on the master bedroom floor. Any house would be more than proud to have this as their main Newell Post. And here at the Treadwell House, 
this was a secondary newel post, still hand carving, probably the same hand, just not as much of it, and still solid mahogany. So when your more exalted guests, those who are allowed up to a secondary floor, came up there, you still put on a show. Now, one of the things I want to talk about in the two master bedrooms is something visitors to the house often miss unless it's specifically pointed out to them. And it's not on the general tour, excuse me. This photo shows the front bedroom, which we have interpreted as Seabury Treadwell's bedroom. Notice in particular the ceiling medallion. Although it's not recessed, it is very much in flavor with the grander medallions you saw on the parlor floor. And again, very similar also to that one in 26 Bond Street. Now let's take a look at the medallion in the rear bedroom. I think you can see right away that there's something very different going on here. And I'm gonna go back. You can see not only in detail, but in scale that this medallion, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna call it wimpy. And it is wimpy, it's small, it's also stylistically not correct. It has very little Grecian going on about it. Again, here is the front medallion, very much with the same elements you see elsewhere on the parlor floor. And here, the rear medallion, where nothing resembles the plaster work anywhere else in the house. And here is my proposal. In 1855, the Treadwells had the house plumbed for illuminating gas. Whereas on the parlor floor, they hung gasoliers from the two medallions. They clearly specified that those medallions would not be destroyed or injured in any way with the insertion of the plumbing for the gas. And anything that was damaged had to be repaired. However, in the rear bedroom, master bedroom, this clearly was not the case. And so that larger medallion you see in the front bedroom was removed, the gas pipe was inserted, and then basically a store-bought over-the-counter medallion replaced the much larger, much more stylistically correct uh, medallion in this room. In 1855, this would have been the height of fashion. And this is one of the rare instances in this house where the Treadwells made modern improvements to the house later in the century without a conscious effort to keep them looking Grecian. Grecian even to the run molding on the ceiling. This is a combination of run molding where plaster was applied to the ceiling and then a template form was run across it and then inserted precast plaster medallions in the corner. Again, this is all very, very Grecian in style. One of the wonderful features of the merchant's house is the fact that they have huge closets in the house as well. They needed those closets for something, so the age of consumerism was upon us by this point. That dress, by the way, is not part of the uh, Treadwell collection, in case anybody was wondering. It's part of a special installation uh, that is still in the house right now, waiting for the house to reopen so people can enjoy it. Even the walkthrough, there's an interior pass-through between the two master bedrooms, so they were connected um, privately as well as in the hallway outside, which was shared with the rest of the family. But even this pass-through, not only very luxurious storage space, but notice the Grecian feel to the space. You've got the suggestion of pilasters here, run molding, which could have been run by machine at this point, and an entablature running across the top with little dental molding underneath. You've got a little bit of Athens right here in their storage area, pass through between the two bedrooms. And once again, you've got early American pressed glass on the drawers and cupboard doors. Make a point of remembering this image because we're going to look at the one on the third floor and it's going to tell us a very different message. This room I've always found intriguing. This is a spare room, which is located just over the vestibule downstairs. 
So there are actually three chambers on the master bedroom floor. This room connects with the front bedroom as well as with the hallway. My back is to the entrance door from the hallway. And through the course of the 19th century, this uh, room would have been used for many different things, depending on the needs of the family living within the space. It could have been a box room, it could have been a dressing room. It was probably a nursery. Gertrude was born in this house in 1840, the only one of the children who, was bo who were born here. And the odds are this was probably a nursery for her in her early, in her infancy. But what is really singular about this room is the style of the framing around the windows and the doors. Those of you who are familiar with some of the earlier houses in the West Village, particularly those on, on King and Charlton Streets, are familiar with this style of box in the corners of in framing with a canvas leaf carving inside it. By 1832, this was ex extremely out of style. And I'm so intrigued as to why this room is the only room in the merchant's house that has this very, very typical federal styling inside it. And I only wish that the twin next door was still standing and that enough of the detailing in this room and the twin survived so that we could see if the twin had this identical framing inside it. It's, it's a mystery and it's something we'll probably never have the answer to. But those corner blocks are really, really very um, retarded tear, as they say, by this point in time, by 1832. I have yet to analyze them. I'm, I'm very curious to know whether these are carved wood or molded plaster. And it's something I really need to do someday. So I'm sorry I can't answer to that question at the moment. At the moment. So looking back down at the master bedroom floor, you see the window uh, at the landing, shuttered now. There are shutters on all the windows in the house, and this was designed as much to keep heat within the house as to keep the house secure when the family was living elsewhere. They had a country house in Rumson, New Jersey, and they spent their summers there. But uh, these are very useful both for security and for heat retention. But here we come up to the third floor, which we call the children's floor. And here is another clue, not of how to behave, but that something has changed. This newel post is very late, comparatively speaking, and dates from the 1870s. The reason being that the Treadwells installed a hand hoist elevator in the house at some point in the 1870s to accommodate one of their daughters who had had a spinal injury. It is said that she was an avid horsewoman and she injured her spine driving a, a coach. And so she had difficulty with all these stairs. When they pulled the staircase forward on, the, on the, this, la, uh, this uh, run of stairs forward, they had to install a new newel post. And again, one of the rare instances when they went with something modern instead of Grecian in style. Here's another example of trying to get light into a space. The third floor children's rooms are the only landing in the museum that does not have natural light of any sort immediately adjacent. And so the two small bedrooms, one over the bedroom I just showed you and one in the rear over the curve in the staircase, both have transom windows of glass over them. So this both allows light to penetrate into the third floor landing. And when you open those windows, you had cross ventilation. So you could still have pri privacy in these rooms, but get cross ventilation because there's only one window in each of these rooms. But notice the molding. The molding has changed drastically, certainly from the parlor floor and even from the less grand, but still very Grecian molding on the master bedroom floor. We have entered a private world here. Who would be admitted to this floor? The children, family members, grandchildren ultimately, and intimate friends of the children and no one else. So we have definitely stepped down in terms of the detailing in the house. And you could literally loosen your, your waistcoat or let down your hair a little bit on this floor because we have left the grand for show 
part of the house and entered a much more intimate, a much less ostentatious part of the house. And the signals are all there for us to see. Also notice the doors. They're standard six panel doors. Some people call these crossover Bible doors. I think you can see why. And the hardware has evolved from silver plated on the parlor floor to simply cast brass on this floor. Still expensive because it was metal, but not of the level that you see on the parlor floor. And the run molding on the third floor does not equate with that on the master bedroom floor as well. No corners, no cast uh, plaster or canthus leaves and set, just a simple run cornice. Still very decorative, very attractive, but uh, the cornice was run not as much to make it attractive as just simply to hide the joint between the ceiling and the walls because that's a very difficult joint to get right. It tends to be very crooked. And so by running uh, plaster molding across that, we call it crown molding today, it covers a multitude of sins. Here's those closets, the same closets you saw on the master bedroom floor, the walkthrough closets and cupboards. Here they are on the third bedroom, the third floor bedrooms, and you can see all pretense to Grecian illusions are gone. It's just simple run molding, stepped, no paneling at all on the drawers, very little paneling on the cupboards, no glass knobs, and these pulls, which I'm very intrigued about, and I'd like to know when they were installed, do they date to the treadmill occupancy or were they added to the drawers in the 1930s? They look to me to be later than 1832, just in terms of the weight and style of them. We're always learning new things about this house. We always uncover new things to share with the public. And so this is something we'll have to look into someday. Now, I also wanted to highlight this fireplace. And we're gonna talk more about the mantelpieces in general. But notice the squareness of this and the plainness of this. Right now, I just wanna talk about the marble itself. This is an example of that lesser marble that the facade of the house was built with. This is without a doubt Sing Sing marble, polished so you can see the grain. And this is very close to what the marble on the exterior of the merchant's house would have looked like when it was new. As I mentioned now, if you walk by, it looks like limestone because it's so pitted and that's from 180 plus years of pollution, quite simply. So I said that that center, uh, the, the side hallway with the two rooms front and back was typical of all the floors of the house with the exception of the fourth floor. The fourth floor has four chambers, one for each of the dormer windows. There's two dormers in the front and two dormers in the back. And then there's a spectacular, very large room in the center, just under the peak of the roof. It's over 16 feet long and 20 feet wide. And it's illuminated by a skylight, which shines down on that staircase leading up from the third floor, from the children's floor. This we call the servant's floor. But without a doubt, it would have been much, it would have served many more functions than just to accommodate servants. Uh, each servant did not get their own bedroom, without a doubt. This is a uh, common misconception today. And the room, although very grand, is extremely plain. There's no detailing in this room at all, except for the framing around the doors, which is identical to that on the bedroom floor just below. Uh, this room would have been a multi-purpose space. Tried, uh, the servants could have worked here. This room would have served for hanging laundry during cold or inclement weather. Uh, it's just a great big room that served whatever needs the family uh, demanded of it. We call it the servant's hall now, but we don't know that that's what the Treadwells called it. And by the way, the furniture that you see being installed in this room are pieces that were brought uh, back to East 4th Street when the house in Rumson was sold in 1926. So this furniture is a more of a more rustic style and most, if not all of it, was never used within the walls of 29 East 4th Street, although some of it could have been used in the houses that Treadwells lived in prior to moving uptown to the suburbs. 
And here is a photo of the bedroom. You saw this same photo in the video. Very plain. Uh, however, one could argue very convincingly that still a much grander room than what uh, all of most, if not all, of the servants had left behind when they came uh, across the sea to become servants in the New World in New York. Plaster walls, glass in the windows, uh, a heating stove in the corner, and furniture. So I'm not saying that every servant, uh, every uh, Irish Catholic young girl who came to New York lived in abject poverty, but the odds are a room like this would have been far grander than what most of them had ever seen at home before coming here. Still, the work was very difficult, so I'm not, I'm not trying to cover that up. And then, talk about raw spaces. I think the clues on this staircase are that basically no one unauthorized should climb these. An extremely steep flight of stairs, unfinished wood, which leads up to the peak, to just under the peak of the peaked roof, the attic of the merchant's house. This is a space no one ever sees for a variety of reasons, including fire regulations. This is where the Treadwell's trunks were discovered in the 1930s, in which were housed the famous textile collection, which we display periodically uh, in the museum. But uh, this strange looking object here in the corner is the enframement of the skylight. So there's a skylight which uh, pokes up above the roof line and then the, sky, the light is directed down towards that staircase and that very large servants hall, as I said, down below. And it even has a panel in it so you can open that up and ventilate the attic when you want to. All right, we are going to make a tremendous leap now and jump all the way down to the basement floor. Uh, those of you who have been to the house, of course, recognize this space. Again, notice the trim. This is the same trim you see on the third floor bedrooms and on the servants' floor as well. This is the intimate world. This world is not intended for, the, for guests, for exalted guests. This is the world that family members and very close intimate friends have been admitted to. And uh, in the uh, video you saw, you heard that the kitchen was shut off from the rest of the house. Here's the perfect example of that. The staircase leading up to the parlor floor is encased, and there's even a door to it. So you, this is the only staircase that has a doorway closing it off from access. So you, close, you shut this door, and the ideal was you did not hear the tumult and furor going on in the kitchen while a meal was, be, a meal was being predicted. Uh, being prepared, sorry, and you didn't smell the odors or feel the heat drifting up the staircase. Uh, by the way, this house was not equipped with a dumb waiter because in the 1830s there was so little formal dining being done that most meals were being taken in the front room, which we're about to look at. Uh, later on in the century, the Treadwells did install a dumb waiter when they began entertaining and dining formally in the rear parlor, but that dumb waiter does not survive, unfortunately. This is the door the Treadwells used. Think of the door you saw upstairs with the grand fan light. Uh, that was for company, as, uh, as you know my mom used to say. This is the door that the Treadwells and the servants and the tradesmen and the callers, the intimate callers, use regularly. This is under the stoop opening to the areaway uh, from the sidewalk. Uh, so there's a hierarchy here too. The front door defines who uses it. Treadwell certainly would have used the front door when they came home from a night at the opera or a concert or a very elegant dinner party elsewhere because it was part of the ritual of going and coming. But when they were just shopping, when they were just coming and going on their own, really nine times out of of 10, they used the lower entrance. And this is the room they used more often than not through the course of the day. The, the front room, the family room, the family parlor. In the 19th century, you see it referred to very frequently in diaries as the basement. So this room has a lot of names. Low ceilings, 
detailing, but again, not grand detailing the way you see upstairs. This was a room family and friends used, but there's a big hint in this room that there's more going on than just kicking off your shoes and reading the newspaper on the couch. And that is this fabulous mantelpiece made of the same very expensive black Port Doro marble that the fireplaces in the parlor floor were made of. Part of the reason being that the sidewalk is right here outside. And if people were being naughty and they peeked into the windows to see what the haves had that they didn't have, one of the clues immediately would have been this mantelpiece, which would have been visible on a dark night from the sidewalk outside. And it also tells us that people were being received into this space. Close family friends, tradesmen, business people, they could have been admitted here as well. So there is an advertisement. There is a statement here on this wall defining the social level of the family residing within this space. Here is the kitchen. You heard me mention in the video you saw that people in fancy dresses did not come into this room. I think this room more than any other room in the house states most clearly that this was a room that was off limits to all but the very, very few. Uh, and as I mentioned, doors define the style of architecture. You could argue that mantelpieces define the function of the rooms within and who would be admitted to them. Here, this mantelpiece, or lack thereof, it's just a simple chimney piece, slabs of stone. This is the only fireplace in the house, by the, by the way, that was intended to burn wood. All the rest of the fireplaces can burn coal. But this house burned wood because in 1832, the technology was still basically open hearth cooking. And that's what this uh, hearth was designed for. Later in the century, the Treadwells installed uh, at least one cast iron stove, very advanced for its date. This is not the Treadwell stove, but one very similar to it, which was made in 1855. When the house was rescued in the 1930s, this kitchen was the room that was most altered from the original. Just the way we do today, the Treadwells updated their kitchen from time to time. And what was in this room was an early electric refrigerator, linoleum on the floor, and um, a 1920s style cooker. So this is a room that had to be brought back more than any other room in the house. But note the mantelpiece here. And here's where the clues begin. This is the mantelpiece you just saw in the family room, just on the other side of the left-hand wall. A far cry from what's here. And this mantelpiece was intended to be seen and to show off the affluence of the family. A step above this, the mantles in the front and back parlor. The same very ornate Port Doro marble, but this is a step above what you see uh, in the family room because these are freestanding ionic columns. It's not run pilasters the way they are here, molded pilasters with a plain top. So you've got better, best, Less better, these are examples of the, this is an example of the two, par, uh, the two mantelpieces in the master bedroom floor. This is not Sing Sing marble, this is statuary marble. So this is a much finer grade of marble. But you can see stylistically, we've returned to the idea of the corner blocks and the moldings on the pilasters. This is also molded across the entablature with a square block medallion inset in the middle. So there's a strong federal feel to this particular mantelpiece, whereas this mantelpiece is leaning towards the Greek Revival, and this mantelpiece is pure Greek Revival. And then just for comparison, let's look at the children's mantelpiece again. So I think you can see the hierarchy of the mantelpieces in terms of the stone used, the decorative details used with, uh, on the mantelpieces, how much these mantelpieces would have cost, and who was permitted or not permitted to see them. One other fine point in the kitchen uh, is this window set into a wall which is now a public restroom. Uh, in 1930s, 
the butler's pantry, which was on the other side of this wall, was converted into two restrooms because the museum was being open to the public and we needed restrooms. And so the window, which was originally in this wall, was removed. For years, it was said that there was a doorway in this wall opening into the butler's pantry. At one point, it was decided uh, that it was time to restore store this final wall in the kitchen, one part of the kitchen that had not been restored. And as we began chipping away at the 1930s plaster, we discovered the enframement not for a door, but for a borrow light window. Now, sometimes they call this a steel light, sometimes they call this a rob light, but the most common term is borrow light. And this, just like those transom windows up on the children's bedroom floor, is designed to allow light from the kitchen to enter into the butler's pantry. So the butler could see what he was doing without having to risk uh, using inflammable liquid in a very enclosed space, or later on lighting the gas. Uh, again, this harkens back to how difficult it was to light these spaces. Needless to say, since this is a public restroom on the other side, this window now uh, butts up against a wall on the other side. So our guests still have privacy. But this is a much more accurate uh, um, representation of what this wall looked like. And again, notice the molding here, not anything grand. Yet it's still molding, it's not just a slab of wood. The, like all of the row houses in this era, the Treadwells had a tea room off the back. Some of the houses, the tea room stretched across the entire back of the house. They called it a piazza. Sometimes it was open, sometimes it was closed. The Treadwells inherited a tea space or a piazza which was just one bay wide and early on their occupancy they enclosed it using these two huge windows compared to the door and you can see how large these windows were so that they had a room in essence they had a four season porch which opened onto their rear yard which today is quite beautiful but in most of the 19th century it consisted more of a scene of industry than it did decorative gardens. Uh, the gardens in most New York City row houses did not become decorative until very late in the 19th or early in the 20th century. But there's even a clue to this rear yard because those of you who live in brownstones or are familiar with them are probably looking at this saying, wow, that looks like a really large garden. It is. The typical lot at the time was 25 by 100 feet wide. The merchant's house was 20 feet, actually 20, 24 and a half feet in the case of the merchant's house because there was a little bit of trouble with surveying before this house was built, but it was 130 feet deep rather than 100 feet deep. And back in the day, there was a gate right here which opened onto an alleyway which is still there. And the name of the alley I just discovered is Stable Alley. And so this was one of the few houses in New York that had an alleyway entrance as well. So tradesmen, workers, laborers could enter through the alley. I don't know why that just happened. Um, but they could enter through the alley and through the rear entrance to the ground floor, to the basement floor as well. And we're approaching my last slide and I wanted to show you that the outdoors extends indoors in an old handmade house. This is not a rubble path in the garden. This is actually the floor of the cellar. These are cobblestones which were laid into the soil of the cellar in 1832. And this is a space no one who visits the house gets to see simply because we are prevented by fire and insurance regulations from allowing people down here. So I hope that I've shared some information with you uh, which you can carry when you look at any building because there is a hierarchy of, of details and materials that define spaces in, in any building, be it a factory building, uh, an office building, or a private house, be it old or be it modern. But this is what we think about the merchant's house, and I hope you do too. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to field them now. And thank you so much for your attention. Anthony, thank you so much. This was wonderful and what an incredible pleasure to see the <laughs> attic. What a treat. Ta da! <laughs>
<laughs> we, um, I want to open the um, Q&A chat up for questions if anybody has them. I've also been taking some questions down that have come up in the chat while you were talking. Mm -hmm. So, um, about speaking of the attic, um, somebody wanted to know why, why the black beams ah, in the okay. attic? Okay, well, I'm sorry they spotted that. When the house was uh, being worked on in the 1930s, one of the workers accidentally set fire to the roof. Oh. Was it in the 1930s or the 1970s? I don't remember now which, which structural restoration. It was put out, and those are still the original beams, but yeah. We, we have nearly lost the merchant's house. I can think of, off the top of my head, at least six times through the course of its existence as a public oh institution. Gosh. So th this is the house of near misses, sometimes I call it. <laughs> Incredible. Um, hold on. There was another question about the... Oh, about wood. Tamara wanted to know, can you speak about the wood flooring? Any differences between the floors? Sure. Uh, no, there is really no difference between the floors because the floors were not meant to be seen. The floor uh, in the 19th century, wall to wall carpeting was the norm. In the kitchen, some sort of oil, oiled cloth or linoleum of some sort uh, would have been used hard cloth that as a protective and through the rest of the house the floors would have been carpeted. Whether that's the case on the servant's floor, further um, investigation is required up there and we would look for the little uh, tack marks on the floor to see whether carpets had been laid down or not. The flooring throughout the house is yellow Georgia pine and uh, um, it's sort of indicative of how there was a globalization of, of uh, trade at the time. This house represents uh, materials that have come from all over the then United States. The flooring came from the South. And you think about those forests in, in interior of Georgia being uh, felled and having the, the lumber shipped to the coast where it could be squared off and then placed in boats and sent up to New York for construction and all the other cities that were building at this time. Think of the slate coming from Vermont and Maine, the soapstone for the sinks in the kitchen coming from Maine, the mahogany coming from Santo Domingo. Uh, it's, it's just kind of incredible when you think about all the places materials were coming from. The marble for the mantelpieces is most likely Italian. And so New York being the center of trade, it was easier to obtain these things in New York than uh, say Cleveland or Chicago or someplace like that, but this is truly a worldwide trade network reflect, reflected in this house. Amazing. Can you see the Q&As? Um, are, are they in the chat? There's a separate button. Oh yes, the okay, there it is. Yeah, let's see. So I... Do I know why the twin house next door did not survive? Um, after Liederkranz moved uh, uptown in 1882, if I've got the date correct, those three houses were ultimately converted into garage space. It's a long, sad story and involves developers and bulldozers in the middle of the night. But by the 1980s, when the houses were illegally demolished, there was so little left of them that, um, one could argue there was nothing worth saving. I mean, I, I know that I just curled a number of people's hair, but um, there was very, very little surviving of those houses. They had been reduced in height. The architectural detail had been removed. Openings for garages had been punched into the facades, and there was, there was just really nothing left. Why did Gertrude die impoverished? Quite simply because the money ran out. Gertrude was not trained to earn a living. Gertrude was a woman who was trained to be a good wife, a good mother, and a decorative asset to her husband, an important asset for his business endeavors because she was trained to interact with the other wives who were trained to do the same sort of thing. The problem with Gertrude, and it's not a unique problem by any means, is that she simply lived too long. 
and the money that she gradually inherited from each of her siblings ran out before she passed on. And by the 19, after she sold the house, the, the country house in Rumson in 1926, she had to live on whatever savings that involved. And let's not forget what happened in 1929. Gertrude died four years after the stock market crash and whatever savings she did have were probably greatly reduced by that as well. Uh, does Sing Sing Marble have anything to do with Sing Sing and Asening? Absolutely. That is exactly correct. Uh, Sing Sing was the name of the town which we now know as Asening. There are marble deposits all around that part of the Hudson Valley. It's very cheap marble, it's very soft marble, uh, and so it fell out of favor. But the, uh, the very first riot, major riot in New York City, which required the calling of the National Guards, was the Stonemasons riot in the 1830s, where they protested uh, inmates of Sing Sing quarrying marble instead of themselves. Sing Sing became associated with the prison and so uh, Asening changed its name to Asening so as not to be associated with the prison. Can I talk more about the front door and the way it stops abruptly? Um, I hope I've answered that question now. Uh, if uh, I feel like you I, did, I, yeah. yeah. If I need to define it further, I just want to say that they wanted to keep the vestibule uh, as narrow as possible without digging into the side lights at the front door. If it wasn't decorative, what was in the backyard? Lawn. Basically, it was a large lawn area. Uh, was it a kitchen garden? Probably not. There was an extremely good garden just up the street near um, Cooper uh, Union. And uh, was it a place for carpentry or other repair work? Probably yes, probably so. You could work up in that large space in the servant's level. You could work in the cellar, or you could take something outside and work on it there. The grass was kept in place so that uh, on, in nice weather, you could spread, spread linens on the grass, and it would acquire the, um, the, the smell of the grass. Do I know if the summer house in Rumston, New Jersey still exists? It existed into the 1990s. And again, it's one of these stories that involves bulldozers in the middle of the night. Although in this case, it involves uh, the family who owned the house, which was a Dutch colonial house. It predated the Treadwell's ownership of it. It went back to colonial times, at least part of it did. They applied for permission from Monmouth County to demolish it because uh, it was a historic structure and their request was denied, <coughs> pardon me. And suddenly during some uh, work being done on the house, uh, a fire broke out. And there just happened to be a bulldozer on the property. And the only way they could put the fire out was by using a bulldozer and demolishing it completely. We've heard this story way too many times. Another question, what kind of pattern is in the carpeting, similar to the ones in the parlors? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I understand that question completely. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I'll answer it by saying that the pattern in the two two formal parlors is an exact reproduction of the pattern that was still there in 1933 when Gertrude passed and her, uh, her, her nephew bought the house. And that was a, a pattern that was installed probably in 1855 at the same time they did work on the gasolier and apparently sort of remodeled and modernized the parlors to make them a little more contemporary. Uh, the, the carpeting on the in the family room is simply a reproduction of a carpeting of the earlier era of the 1820s, 1830s. And we're suggesting by that carpeting being in the family parlor that when they took the carpet out of the front parlor, it having outlived its decorative usefulness, but was still in very good shape since the room was never used, they brought it downstairs uh, to a second best room. So it was a slightly dated pattern, but perfectly useful, perfectly good. This is the way people did things back then. When was the last time the fireplaces were used? That's an extremely good question. Uh, central heat was never installed in the house until it was converted as a museum. So I would guess that this early spring of 1933 was the last time 
the fireplace, at least the one in Gertrude's bedroom was used. Were any of the materials used in the house items um, which Seabury sold? Yes, uh, certainly Seabury sold some of the materials, but bear in mind that Seabury did not build the house. The house was built three years before they bought it. And so um, materials for the house could have been purchased at Treadwell and Kassam, who were the hardware merchants, uh, actually very, very successful hardware merchants, as you can imagine, since he could afford this house. But um, he certainly sold materials like the ones in the house, if not those um, that are in that particular house. And somebody wants to know, where am I sitting right now? I am sitting in my office space in my apartment on West End Avenue. So I am not a downtowner. I am a Brooklyn boy who moved to West End Avenue when I graduated from college because the Bloomingdale area of, uh, of the Upper West Side reminded me of Park Slope where I grew up. Let's see if there are any more questions. Um, I don't see any. Did I miss any, Ariel? I think we're good. Thank you so, You're welcome much. so much. This was wonderful. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was Thanks. a pleasure. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I hope you'll all come back and see visit the Merchant's House when we reopen. We are doing a lot of stuff online uh, through the website and everything. And we have a lot more ambitious plans uh, in store because we know it's not going to be, you know, we're not going back to whatever normal was for a time being. So please visit us online. Visit us. Uh, in bricks and mortar when you have the opportunity to. And thank you so much, Ariel and Sam and GVSHP for affording me the opportunity to talk about a house, which I think you can tell I'm rather fond of. <laughs> As are we. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take good care.